And now I can ask the uh, other speakers to rejoin, uh, so you can unmute yourself and open up your videos uh, for the, the panel discussion. And also uh, Sergey, uh, the CEO from Code Helms, will be joining us um, for our last program point. Um, so just as a, a, a reminder, you can join the Slack community and there's a, a channel um, which is called panel. So if you would like to ask any questions to the panel, uh, just type them there, or as always, you can DM me. Um, and if you want to receive all the videos, please remember to confirm that in the email or uh, follow Code Intelligence on LinkedIn or Twitter. And uh, you can also, of course, follow any of the speakers you are interested in on LinkedIn and Twitter um, to stay in touch there. Okay, it looks like... Uh, so Jasmine still is missing from the panel, but I say let's, let's just uh, start up um, uh, the panel anyway. And I'd actually, actually like to start with you, Sergei, since we've not heard so much from you. So we, we've seen a couple of talks uh, about all the problems we have with uh, security and getting that really kind of up and running. As someone working in a company who sells software testing products, uh, do you see things in such a worrying state as well? Um, no, not from my side. Uh, so can, you, you, you can hear me, right? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, from our side, we, we see some changes. So uh, when we started like in 2018 with the first testing approaches and approach to automotives, um, we... Uh, things were moving slowly and somehow uh, yeah we had to do a lot a lot of uh, work in convincing people but this somehow changed in the last two years basically because on the one hand there are other industries who are talking about DevSecOps and fuzzing and all the kind of stuff uh, and producing good results and on the other hand uh, things also get easier in the automotive sector. So now uh, more and more projects are using, uh, for instance, Linux instead of uh, Autosar uh, or completely commercial uh, tool chain, uh, chains. Uh, so there is definitely change. So I see it in a positive ways uh, for the next few years. But obviously, there are some legacy projects which will be still continued and i think uh, in those kind of projects it's not that easy to move to the new ecosystem and uh, this is something where oems but also all the manufacturers will have a struggle um but for the new projects i'm quite optimistic that uh, uh, those will there the difference uh, to other industries will be uh, just not as big as uh, with the legacy projects. Yeah, I want to add to that what is Sergey said because uh, the famous quote I think from Nagazi, which is they ignore you because these were the days where people are saying, ah, oh, okay, cars will never get connected, who knows who would never attack you and things like this. And then they laugh at you, something like, you know, okay, uh, you start connecting cars, so interesting, and then the fight is there, okay. So this is no win. So we are in this phase, I would say, where we are pretty much uh, coming closer to this, um, as Thomas recently uh, said about the repetitions and the abundant creation. Uh, uh, a lot of, um, how to say, um, um, awareness these days with the relations that, that we are in this phase where I would say there is considerable momentum going further and then also to keep. Keep, keep on uh, anchoring security as, uh, in the root and into all uh, accompanying processes. I'm, I'm having a little few audio issues. Is that just on my end or um, is the audio breaking up for others as well? Just my end? Okay, that's good. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, Jasmine, uh, Thomas uh, at the end said, that uh, in the automotive industry, we're still kind of predominantly with the, the V model of software development, and that there's a long road to go to kind of get into a more agile DevSecOps style development, and that there's a, a big change in company culture needed there, which I think nicely comes back um, to your point that company culture is something really important. Um, have you looked at uh, um, software development uh, processes like kind of 
traditional V model, waterfall model compared to agile development or uh, pair pro? Do, do you have any insights in how that affects pro? I, I seem to recall you said something about pair, pair programming. So um, I haven't looked more into bringing outcomes of using different um, processes. Um, one thing is really important is that each has its own requirements for how agile you can be. So I feel like one example, for example, if you sell crypto code to our friends and you need to get certified, um, it's going to be there's going to be a strong incentive to get things right really early because once you get certified, you can change your code, right? So that kind of um, takes you a little bit away from being able to be agile just because you can't really you can't really update and, and fix and implement new features because what you have to do is you have to get certified each time. So I'm not an expert on the um, automotive um, industry, but um, it, it seems to me that updating um, updating software in cars seems to be something that's also done infrequently. And um, we can't live with, oh, you know, like uh, once a year, um, people bring their cars in for inspection and then they're being updated. And, um, oh, whoopsie, this time we have like a little problem and we need to fix it again pretty soon. So I feel like um, certain development uh, process models um, May, may just be really, really hard to get to if you have the requirement that you can't really patch frequently and easily and that um, rolling out new features, rolling out new security fixes um, is really, really um, exhausting and expensive and comes with negative publicity. So um, I'm not sure whether there is like a really good solution where we can say, oh, everyone should be should be following, like no matter if they're developing an app or whether they're developing um, something that needs to be more durable and can't be patched. Everyone needs to have the same development process. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, it does. Thank you. Um, Sergey, uh, I mean, you've gone into many companies now and helped them introduce fuzzing. Uh, what, what's your experience with uh, the different development models? I can't hear you, Sergey. I think you're, no, you're not muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, perfect. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, can could you, uh, somehow uh, the audio was broken. The question was the different development models uh, were, uh, could you repeat the question? Yeah, so, so, so basically when you started out saying that DevSecOps is something important, uh, I was interested in your experience I mean, you've gone into companies where I'm assuming they still had very kind of classical traditional models of write the software for half a year, test it for a couple of months, then release it, and then the cycle begins again, which uh, is probably not the, the current form of doing it. What, what's your experience being introducing fuzzing into that kind of environment? How, how willing are people to update their process to go into more, let's say, continuous integration-based testing? Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it so much uh, uh, from the perspective of what kind of model, because most of the companies claim that they do agile and DevSecOps. So we have never uh, had a company who is saying that they don't do it, but somehow they still have the security and Q and A and development departments. Um, what we experienced with uh, introducing or fuzzing is somehow that the developers often. Uh, feel kind of offended because if we present the results and now with the first fuzzing we find something like uh, hundreds of uh, buffer overflows um, uh, then uh, the discussions with the developers start uh, something oh those are not so bad and so on and uh, what we experienced is uh, that at some point we did the presentation after fixing the bugs. So basically what we did every time we found the first bugs, we just fixed them silently and then made merge requests that uh, the fixes were accepted. And then in the end, we started to do the presentation and this is what fuzzing brought you. And then we tell what kind of issues were found uh, with fuzzing. But this way, 
there was far less resistance. So I guess uh, it's still a company uh, or a developer's perspective. Now there is someone who is judging uh, my code. And I think that when companies introduce new testing technologies, finding errors, they need to consider how to make it less uh, painful or offensive uh, for the developers. Hmm. Uh, Victor, are you still in the panel? Can, can you? I'm here. Oh yeah, lovely, great, thank you. Um, so I, that kind of rings a, a bell in my memory that you said that one of the ways you kind of got uh, your company interested in, in fuzzing was through the hackathon uh, day. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit, a bit more, where did you add it in your software development process? Was it something which was kind of done at the end or could you integrate that into your process uh, or kind of in a, in a shift left way? This is now at the end. So now we, we are in a phase where just before the penetration testing, we, we run the fuzzing. And of course, the, the plan is now to integrate it in the GitHub so that the developers can directly uh, use the tool. And we, we run it, I don't know, with the nightly builds. And after that, they can immediately see whatever uh, issues they introduced. Oh, interesting, thank you. Um, Thomas, what, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so I think it's, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. You okay. I think it, it's, it's important to, to do those two things. Uh, one thing is, of course, saying where, where the problems are and let's say also showing them concretely. And Hackerson is, is definitely one, one thing or let's say testing tools like Sergey was just mentioning. So testing them and, and showing the problems. On the other hand, uh, let's say also helping people and, and leave them not alone on, on, let's say, on the problems. So we really, as security experts, uh, we also need to help them uh, to solve them. Because it's not, normally people don't do this on, on purpose, it's just what happens. And so it's, it's something that has to be also with, with uh, let's say, the nature of, of the, the programmers in itself. They want to do a good job. And if you show them, okay, here's a problem in your code, well, it's, it's, it's normal. You have to understand it's normal. You have to have, we have problems in your code. That's, that's, that's it, it. And then you have also security problems in your code. Oh man, another problem in my code, what can you do? So we need to help them and say, okay, listen, uh, I, I, I help you here. We go together through, through this and um, we fix this together. And then you can go to your management and, and, and tell the success story. Uh, so it, it needs to be, let's say, something, a, a balance between showing the problems and, and helping people to fix. Hmm. So that, that kind of brings us back to the, the human factors, which I also have seen in, in my work so many times. Uh, but one of the things which I found quite interesting in my research in, into fuzzing is that unlike static analysis, um, developers actually felt quite positively towards fuzzing because they really noticed a benefit. Um, so while while their views on static analysis was very much, okay, I get this huge dump of, of messages and then the tool says, now that's your problem. Uh, fuzzing while having a slightly higher initial setup cost, it was a bit more difficult to use. Once it started running, it, it, it produced helpful things. So maybe there a question to, to Jasmine. Um, how much do you think kind of um, that the a good usability or functionality of the of security software is important to create this shift in culture we've heard so many times, which is needed? I I really like this question. So I think if um if you already have all the buy-in in the world and the company invests like all the money um, th that they need to spend and all the and you have high expertise on developers and everyone already has a security mindset, you can get away with somewhat unusable tools, right? But um, this is just not the reality in most companies. So usually what you get is maybe reluctant buy-in and maybe, well, we should be doing security, but we have so many other things to do. So um, in this reality of no one has time to, you know, fiddle with unusable tools. Um, obviously, you want um, you want developer tools to be as usable as possible. And then also, um, all the time that people spend on sorting through um, unreadable warning messages is just time that they 
don't spend on fixing that code, right? So um, I, I would wholeheartedly agree that usability of tools that support secure development should be good and that this mindset of, oh, you know, it's just, you know, business to business software or our users are experts We're we're not dealing with end users. So we don't need good usability that this is this is not a winning mindset. Um, so yes, definitely uh, the developers of secure development support tools should definitely consider usability. Oh, very good. Thank you. So actually, we're having a question from the audience. Uh, Mirad is asking, um, oh. If researchers find and announce vulnerabilities in automotive vehicles, it will be more time consuming to patch them than in other IT sectors. What if attackers take this opportunity to exploit them before they are patched? What are your opinions about this? Who would like to jump in on that one? I guess that's the reason why we need over the year updates so that we can always push the, the fixes as soon as possible. Of course, if they are not in the, in the mask room. Yeah, yeah, Jasmine, please. And also, we do so. This this model of researchers find something and post it online is maybe not an entirely a, um, a mindset that's reflective of reality. So usually, there's a lot of responsible disclosure involved. So you are going to um, contact the company where you found problems and give them ample time and opportunity to fix before you publish your results. So maybe the results are open to like a really, really small subset of the research community that maybe reviews um, reviews it. Um, but usually ethical researchers, and that's, I wanna say that's the big majority of us, um, are going to work with companies and only publish their findings after the companies have had time to fix the problems. So it's, it's not like we find problems, post them online, and then there's the one year delay um, while, where this is known and open and companies to basically scramble to fix it. Yeah, yeah, Thomas. I can't hear yet. I think you're still muted. It says you're muted. So on the icon for whatever reason. Yeah. Okay, so strangely, in the other part of the interface, it says you're not yeah, muted. Thomas, can you now, now I can. There was no yes. icon that I couldn't un unmute. Now I can. Sorry. <laughs> Click meeting is not showing itself on its best side today, is it? <laughs> it's, it's fine. That's uh, maybe there are some hackers in in the background uh, wanting to not <laughs> not discuss about uh, 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 fussing uh, things. So now you have to help me. What was the question again? I wanted to answer, but now I lost my thread. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, we're talking about responsible disclosure in the automotive sector. Ah, okay, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, wait perfect. till they get a clear. Yeah, yeah. So let's say what one thing that I did uh, over over the last years, um, we established um, at Bosch not only a cert but also a P cert, which is basically uh, um, exactly the same kind of activities that you have known from the IT kind of infrastructure security world. We have teams that uh, really can jump in once there's a problem. And we established this for products. And I think this is very important to, and, and many, many OEMs and many, many two tier ones by now have, have this kind of activities. And they are also connected uh, to each other. So really, if there is a problem, if you have somebody who found a problem in your code, in your products, uh, that they have an expert that they can talk to and an internal process how you handle this security problem because this is just natural this happens but if you are let's say then in a crisis modus then you cannot work on these problems let's say on on a very efficient and, and straight way so it's very important not only if you have problems in your IT systems but all, also if you have problems in your products you need to have uh, processes, you need to have people that really work on this and, and maybe reconstruct the problem and, and so forth to the communication. There's many things that you have to do once there is, is this problem happening. And so we should have, let's say more, I, I would I would try to advertise for more norm, norm, normal behavior if there's a security problem in, in your products because it just happens. Just be normal as you, as you get some other problems in your software, maybe your function doesn't work. Just work as a normal process. Work on your on your security problem, fix it, and then communicate with with uh, your your customers. The question was also: Do you publish this or not? 
this is of course a very critical problem um, and um, we debate this internally actually quite a bit because we cannot just fix your problem in the car if, if it's on the street. It's not like your, let's say, wi Windows machine that is connected and you can fix every every second basically with a new with a new software. This is not possible. So it's 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 really something that I'm trying to keep on the on the expert level. Should we um, publish this or not? And and we debate this with. Right now, we debate this actually on a case by case basis. Oh, interesting. Um, and for us, what 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 happened? Uh, just one additional thought. Fully agree with with what Thomas was mentioning. Uh, usually, uh, as Yasmin was mentioning, we we get informed by by the researchers. We we receive some time until we we can answer, and then we speak with the OEM. We speak with a supplier if if we take the software from someone else. And uh, then, of course, they have uh, all the rights to, to publish this, and they will probably publish it uh, on, a, on a conference. But we, we always had the time so, uh, to, to react if, if it came from a, from a so-called white hat hacker. OK. So there's another audience question, which I think uh, Rakshit probably can give us some insights on. Uh, Torbjörn is asking, how can we develop helpful tools if we can't get our hands on automotive code especially if constraints are very different in this domain, like tool chains are unique and so on. Uh, the situation in the non-automotive world is very different since everyone has access to the, the hardware. I know you've done, you've, you've been looking at how can you get fuzzing running uh, on Linux systems, even though you don't have the hardware. What, what do you say to Torbjörn? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good remark and a good question overall. So I think the answer to this goes to in the direction of something like finding a foot in the door. So I would recommend in this case, because you know um, automotive systems are in that sense more or less proprietary, so not, not everyone would have access to it, but you would have some pre-development divisions or R&D divisions like where I am, who are very open to these techniques because we know the problem is big. We know that we cannot solve everything on our own. So I would say you could find these multipliers for you, get some proof of concepts and then get started get started with these kind of activities than having to all, always assume that oh you don't have access so all you can do is just reverse engineering right so i would say uh, just leverage your contacts and then try to get some some um some testing done uh, i would say just just start contacting people and get uh, start testing in that case oh, excellent um i'd i'd like to kind of um cycle back to the um how do we integrate this into the development process? Because um, that does touch on this as well. So uh, not only do we have the problem of uh, this software being often run on proprietary hardware, it's also something which is usually integrated into incredibly complex tool chains. Mm. Um, do you see any kind of potential for kind of more openness in the automotive industry? Because I know that I've contacted companies before and have had a very hard time kind of getting a foothold uh, with lots of NDAs being signed and, and similar things. Uh, and of course, the as, as maybe um, uh, Thomas also mentioned, the development process is incredibly important. Do you, do you see any kind of ways that could become more transparent in the automotive branch, Rakshit? Yes, of course. I think that that should be the way forward now. The the transparency, especially um, as I mentioned, um, I think to a reasonable extent, it's also um, it's also reasonable to assume that there are so many different tools used in so many different levels, right? So it's uh, the part for this uh, kind of resistance. What you feel is just because be test engineers or be developers, they are bombarded with so many things which are apart from actually core development, what they do, right? And that's the reason why they are all the time skeptical when yet another tool pops up, the radar, right? So I would say in this case, the key to really is to get the, consider them as the very, very uh, important stakeholders and get their buy-in from the developer level to begin with. And at the same time, you have to ring multiple levels within the organization to also get the priority and to also prioritize these kind of testing uh, things also because of uh, by creating awareness at the management level right so we need to run um, 
these things, not, not in isolation, just with developers, but we have to really try different levels of organization as well to create awareness from bottom up and top down and to anchor this firmly into the development process. So it's not just a tool issue, it's not just a usability issue, but it's also, I would say, many, many different stakeholders in this landscape. I would definitely agree with what, what Rakshik was saying, because let's say you also have to see that uh, this industry is, is a very old industry and, and coming from, let's say, banding ma material uh, in, in the beginning and not, not having wires and electronic in, in the car. Uh, and let's say this is now moving into a, into a, let's say over the last years, in, into a software kind of uh, industry, which is more like an, uh, a handy, uh, um, an iPhone on, on, on wheels instead, instead of being a car. So I think it's, 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 it's still, again, it's, it's a whole kind of society, a whole kind of ecosystem that needs to move into this direction. And this just not happens, let's say, overnight. I can I can tell you, let's say, if, if when I started 15, 20 years ago with automotive security, when I gave a talk or I had a customer meeting, I was really, let's say, talking about, let's say, 80, 85, 90 percent about why security is necessary in this industry. And then I had like one slide, two slides where I could present my technology and then I had to sum up and then I was kicked out of, of the meetings because nobody believed me that security is important. Today you come in, into the into the game and uh, you have a meeting and you say security. You you don't you don't even need to explain that this is important. And if you talk about let's say testing, fast testing, pen testing, whatever, these are already let's say names. These are, are are words that that actually are known by 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 the by the domain. They are known by the experts. They are known by management that this is important. So nowadays I can really spend let's say. Now, 85, 90 percent of my time discussing about all these technical issues, uh, discussing about how we actually make our cars more secure. How do we make our connections more secure? How do we make our back end production and so, and so forth more secure? I think so there is already a big we, we did a big step forward, if, if I can talk as, as for the whole community. But as you said that. Your question regarding, let's say, more openness, it's still a way to go. And, and I, I really believe that we are on the right way, but we still need to work all together. And this is not only me. This is not only us here in, in the call. This is, as Rakshit said, this is very important. Everybody needs to be, let's say, in, in the boat here. That's a, a really interesting point. I like how you point out that kind of the automotive industry is a very old industry and a lot of kind of processes have grown over time. And if I look at companies which kind of are the, um, the, the beacons of fuzzing, there's companies like Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Cisco, they, they all use fuzzing really extensively to great effect. But they often have slogans like move fast and break stuff. With the automotive industry, I can understand that they don't say our motto is move fast and break stuff because breaking things can be dangerous. Do we need a move fast but don't break stuff slow for the automotive industry sergey maybe what's your view there can you move fast and still be safe oh uh, actually uh maybe uh, so um uh the thing is uh, that often the processes are really hard in the automotive sector but solving the, the technical issues doesn't take too much time and I think that uh, there is a huge overhead uh, uh, coming uh, from basically legacy overhead uh, for instance we just mentioned with uh, confidential uh, so, so basically uh, we want to disclose bugs what happens in the automotive industry compared to the normal industry I would say or the software industry is that they have NDAs with thousands of suppliers. It's uh, like the, the, the automotive industry is very proud for the suppliers. And now they have NDAs and uh, specific agreements with all the suppliers. And now, now someone uh, tells that there is a bug in there. What happens is that you have to find out who's responsible for what. And, uh, also, if you introduce something new in the development process, you need to get all the suppliers on board. Um, so it's more like a process issue because what we experience when we introduce things um, like uh, from the technical perspective, that this is far easier. So uh, it takes less time 
uh, than anticipated in the beginning or was feared by the developers in the beginning. So um, probably, so it's like legacy issues and somehow you have to solve this chicken egg problem uh, to get to new faster processes. And I think there are some um, automotive players who don't follow the, those rules uh, uh, too much. And I mean, Tesla is one example for this because uh, they somehow created something new entirely. They didn't rely on the supply, and uh, supply chain that much as uh, the rest of the automotive uh, sector. Okay. Okay, I saw uh, Victor raise his hand. Yep, I, I think the UNEC regulation will help because if you are forcing the OEM to do the type approval, then you are cascading this in the supply chain. So basically, if the OEM needs to uh, to come with with the type approval, then they, they will cascade this requirement to the tier ones. The tier ones will need to cascade it to uh, to the several suppliers. So I think it will take time, but I think as Thomas mentioned. We clearly improved in the last years, and it, it's clearly going in, in the right direction with the regulation. And I, b I believe that like this, it will happen in the end. I believe we will also be forced somehow to improve because of the transformation in the direction of high performance computers, because then you will put even more software together, and then you will need to have more process ways to check the security. And I think okay. that's uh, just to add on this, uh, it, it's very important what you said, Victor, because let's say even if you um, are a supplier and you put a little piece of software into a car and now you discover a problem in your software and you even know to whom to report to, it's extremely difficult to find out how important or how, how security relevant this problem is to the whole over car. Right? So it might be even if you use the standard ways of classifying your security problem in your software piece, and it might be a severe problem, you might have done a really, really bad job in security. But now you, you cascade this, maybe you're tier two, you cascade this to tier one, uh, to Conti or to Bosch, or you, then to the OEM. How important or how, secure, how, how security relevant is this little piece of software on a system level? Maybe it's not relevant at all. So all this kind of, let's say, things that you are easily be able to do on your little piece of software, it's very complex in the whole ecosystem. And, and is this really not an easy job, let's say, to kind of work in, in, in this together? And, and I, I totally agree with you, Victor, that UNIC is, is, is definitely the right step in, in the right direction. Okay, so I would love to uh, spend the next couple of hours continuing the discussion, but sadly our time is almost up. So um, I'd like to uh, thank all the panel members again and ask each for a, a final call to action. And I'll go in, in reverse order. So um, Thomas, uh, you can start with what, what you'd like to see as the next steps or a call to action from you, please. Yeah, so from my point of view, uh, as, as I also mentioned uh, different times in my talk and, and during the discussion, for me it's important that we all work together, that uh, it's, it's, a, it's an, a common effort that we have to do, let's say from the fussing community to the research community to the automotive uh, community. Everybody needs to work together to make, make this happen. And for me, it's, it's really, really important for somebody who, who loves security Please don't forget to consider the whole life cycle and everything that is part of the system. Just, let's say, look into your development, uh, look into your uh, um, requirement design, uh, development, testing, uh, production, aftermarket, and so forth. So really everything needs to be considered, every part in, in the system uh, being from the small center in the car to the back end cloud. So please don't forget that uh, we can only win the security race here if, if we consider uh, the, the whole system. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Victor, your call to action, please. Yes. So what, what I would like to transmit is, and I, I'm trying to do this every day, uh, security in the end, it's common sense. It's software in the end. It, it's not something that a special group of people should do and uh, we just call them when we have some problems. It should be embedded in, in the products that we product, that we produce, and it, it 
it, everybody needs to take care of it. Otherwise, we have no chance. So I hope that with these new regulations, with the new processes that we are adding, and hopefully with the great tools that companies like Code Intelligence are, are uh, providing, we will be able to, to tackle this together. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jasmine, are you still there? Yes, hi. Um, I think um, what uh, one thing what uh, Thomas said, right? You need um, buy-in all the way through the development life cycle or whatever development process it is you have, and you can't just leave out some parts. But also, um, every single person who, who um, works on security uh, or works on components that may be necessary for security really needs a strong security mindset, and um, this needs to be supported supported in the company from the top down. So basically, it's really important that um, whoever makes the decisions really makes sure that they're not just saying security is important, but that they're also investing in the usable tools and that they're also um, OK with people spending time, effort, education um, on security, and that that's something that's supported. OK. Rakshit, your call to action. OK, my last statement. So I would say, yeah, definitely adding on to the first few, security is definitely a mindset uh, issue and it's um, also sometimes cultural issue. We should, in this age of connectivity, treat it as an enabler for a lot of different interesting features which would come up. And that's where I see that uh, fuzzing being one of the core techniques for testing or security VNV is really ripe at the moment. And it's the time now to really start using it because there are also interesting tools out there. So if you don't fuss, someone else would do it. And lastly, I would say, we should all just have a little less conversation, a little more action and just start doing things, right? Okay. Great, thank you. Okay, Sergey, your call to action. Yeah, my call to action, I would basically uh, agree with everyone before with the uh, call to action that uh, security uh, uh needs to be like is not something is not a department is not something what you put at the end but it's like the entire process and what you see in automotive uh very good that q and a uh is really good or uh, is done extensively for years and now uh basically that they would plan a similar uh, or I would hope that uh, automotive is planning the, the same thing for security and I definitely see a trend that it's uh, going there and I hope that uh, it will finish as I am expecting that okay great okay that brings us to the end I'd like to thank all the speakers and panelists uh, I apologize for the technical difficulties we had um, and thank you all for bearing with us um, if you enjoyed the event as much as I did, uh, I hope so very much. Uh, please follow Code Intelligence on LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube. There will be more events like this uh, coming in spring 2021. Um, and thank you to the audience for all the interesting questions. Uh, sorry we couldn't get all of them asked. Uh, I actually got quite a number of uh, DM questions about how to introduce fuzzing. If uh, the speakers haven't already answered all your questions, do feel free to reach out to the speakers or Code Intelligence. They will be happy to help you uh, with your fuzzing and software testing questions and wishes. Okay, with that, we're at the end. Thank you all and uh, have a lovely afternoon. <laughs>